on to this overview over the volume Life in Transit, Theological and Ethics Contribution in Migration, which is volume two in the Reformed Theology in Africa series. My name is Minetza Kotze. I'm a senior lecturer in Dogmatics and Ethics at the Faculty of Theology at Northwest University in South Africa, and I'm one of the co-editors of this volume. Uh, my name is Rian Reder. I'm part of the Unit for Reformed Theology and the Development of the South African Society at the Faculty of Theology, Northwest University, Potchefstroom, South Africa. Now, migration is a hot bottom topic that's under discussion worldwide and it's taking place at an unprecedented scale. There's been a number of other publications on the topic of migration, but reflections from theology and Christian ethics are often lacking. But a number of the questions that migration raises, questions about land, belonging, identity and community, are questions that are also inherently theological. And therefore, the reflections in this volume by theologians and Christian ethicists can have a valuable influence. Chapter one, written by Albert Kutsia. The title of the chapter is Love Thy Soyona by Integrating Them, an Ethical Perspective from the Pentateuch. This chapter aims to give an answer to the complexities of migration by focusing on the Pentateuch. The specific aim is to give an overview of what the laws of the Pentateuch as a whole say about sojourners or migrants. The special contribution of this study is that these laws are aimed at integrating non-Israelites into the history and the religion of Israel as a process of love. Is there also a practical side to this article? So the article ends by giving some suggestions on how this integrating can be done in a modern context. Chapter two, then written by Christopher Magezi, and this chapter titled Migration of God's People as an Opportunity to Learn and Understand God Within Migrant Context, a perspective from the book of books of Exodus and Acts, it argues that the contemporary church can no longer afford to ignore the increasing number of migrants and the challenges they face. However, at present, the church is not responding effectively. And this chapter is in a quest for theology of migration that would effectively drive the church's migrant ministries. Does the chapter then make a proposal for what such a theology of migration could look like? Well, emerging from the proposed biblical passages, is the notion that the migration of God's people is an opportunity for them to learn and understand the far-reaching implications of God's plans, purposes, nature and character within migrant context. And Dr. Magezi challenges the church to find ways to respond effectively to migrants' challenges. Chapter 3, written by Jan Durant. Title, What can we learn from Paul, the Jew, Migration Dynamics to Accommodate the Stranger Amidst the Jewish Diaspora. This research wants to show how did Paul bridge the cultural and religious gap between Jewish Christians in diaspora all over the world and the Greco-Roman cultures. Paul's answer lies in the diaspora dynamics he applied. The author identifies approximately 20 migration problem-solving dynamics to help the people in diaspora or helping the migrants. These dynamics can all be summarized by two concepts, namely love for the neighbor and xenophilia. The Apostle Paul's role was to create xenophilia instead of xenophobia. So what are then two very important concepts defining the migrant wherever they may find themselves? Freedom in Christ and a new life in Christ. Chapter four, then written by Nico Forster, and in this chapter titled Migration and Christian Identity, Theological Reflections on Christian Identity Reconstructions in New Spaces and Places, Prof. Forster uh, uses identity to refer to the way people view themselves in relation to physical spaces and social spaces. And this chapter examines the effect that global migrations have on individual identity by reflecting on questions such as how does living in a new place and space, belonging to a new society 
and being part of a community with a different set of moral ideals or religious values influence the self-definitions of migrants? And how should receiving Christian communities and Christian immigrants respond to these challenges of migration? Then what is the conclusion that the chapter reaches in response to these questions? Well, the chapter integrates social, scientific and biblical insights into a Christian ethical framework that provides frame, uh, guidelines for receiving Christian communities and Christian immigrants on how to respond to migration and identity reconstruction within these changing environments. Chapter 5, written by Chris Foster. Title, Human Personhood and the Call to Humanness in Environment of Migration and Christian Ethical Perspective. This study wants to give a theological ethical perspective on the life and the personhood of the migrant. All human life as the breath of God is unique and sacred. All humans are the image of God, which implies in it human dignity. These essentials of all human life should guide us to be the voice of the migrant. And what is then the task of the church? So the task of the church is to preach and promote the sacredness and human dignity of the migrant. Um, chapter 6 is written by Matthew Kamink, and in this chapter, which is titled Muslim Immigration and Reformed Christology, Prof. Kamink argues that if people accept the call to follow Jesus amidst the debate over Muslim immigration, they will quickly be flooded and overwhelmed by two realities. Firstly, the conflict will overwhelm them with its complexity and scale. And secondly, if Christians are not already overwhelmed by the scope of the crisis, they will certainly be overwhelmed by the scope of Christ's call. So what is an appropriate response then? One that does not overwhelm? Well, Christian disciples attempting to follow Jesus amidst the debate over Muslim immigration can know that Christ does not simply walk in front of them as a distant moral ideal, but he walks alongside them as well. The moral and political paralysis one feels, um, the sense of being overwhelmed by the size and complexity of the crisis, is birthed from the mistaken notion that it's the Christian and not Christ that must somehow solve this issue. Chapter 7, written by Rian Rieder. The title of this chapter is The Phenomenon of Immigration of Health Practitioners in South Africa, a Protestant Perspective on Global Guidance for the Individual uh, Decision. The migration of health workers from South Africa to other countries is a huge ethical problem. The Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights recognizes that the health worker has two rights or responsibilities. On the one side, the right to autonomy to make their own decision to leave or stay. But on the other side also has a responsibility to the health of their own people or country. The principles of freedom and social responsibility as described by, by the Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights are supported by Protestant ethics. But different from this declaration, Christian ethics point to the prioritization of the interests of the vulnerable community over autonomy. So what is then the most important theologi theological directive that can help the health workers in choosing between autonomy and social responsibility. So the most important directive is the conviction that the attitude of the health worker should be represent the attitude of Christ, which is an attitude of self-sacrificing, meaning putting the interest of other before your own interest. Chapter eight, then written by Minitza Kotze, that's me. And in this chapter, titled A Christian Ethical Reflection on Transnational Assisted Reproductive Technology, I look at the issue of the utilization of donors in reproductive technology, and in particular when this donation occurs across national borders. Specifically, how the excluded become part of a system that excludes them, not as beneficiaries, but through exploitation. And in particular, how this affects migrants, or the unique contribution that this chapter hopes to make. What makes this a unique contribution? 
Well, while the concern and respect for vulnerability is a general bioethical principle, I offer a Christian ethical response by focusing also on the themes of covenant and solidarity with the vulnerable, drawing especially from the work of liberation theologians, uh, such as Russell Bortman and Gustavo Gutierrez, as well as from the Accra Declaration. Chapter 9, written by Marius Nell. The title of this chapter is Violence Against the Displaced, an African Pentecostal Response. Since 1994, South African society has been stained by several incidents of xenophobic violence. According to this chapter, the Pentecostal movement should reconsider its pacifist sentiment and response to the displaced and the migrants. Motivated by their distinctive pneumatology, the Pentecostal movement will be convinced to exchange inbred fear for the stranger for sympathy of brotherly and sisterly love. So what is then one of the most important tasks of the church according to the Pentecostal movement with regard to migrants? Christian hospitality. And this means an attitude of sharing, welcoming, embracing, and all-inclusive commonality towards the migrant. Chapter 10 is written by Johannes Erich, and in this chapter titled Religious Pluralization and the Identity of Diakonia in Germany, Prof. Erich notes that the situation of the religious pluralization constitutes a challenge for the Christian social services operated by church-based organization to open itself in terms of interreligious dialogue and to develop corresponding concepts. And he examines the questions, what impact does this change have on the attempt to form a diaconical identity? And in what ways can this identity be presented under the condition of religious pluralization? So what does this then mean in practice for institution of diaconia? Well, communication spaces for the gospel must be opened up where people are able to discuss how the Christian interpretation of reality in regard to helping is questioned, but also appreciated through encountering others. Prof. Erich indicates that the fundamental principles of this Christian understanding are to be found and lived in an appreciative and accepting manner within this dialogue. Chapter 11, last chapter of the book written by Nas Ferrara. And the title of this chapter is Life in Transit from Exiles to, Pil to Pilgrims, a Missiological Perspective on Humanity's Global Movement. The article focuses on cities of the world as centers of receiving migrants. A hundred years ago, we sent missionaries to the nations to look for cities. Today, you go to cities and you find nations. The church should seek to understand a new urbanism and embrace globalism in a biblical sense. This mean, means that the church, the Christian church in the city, should lovingly engage the city and the migrant, seeking each shalom and provide and promote the peace of all migrants. So what is then the missional message of the church to urban migrants? So the missional message to migrants is to convince them to move to God and to move with God to their final destination. To conclude this short overview then, uh, this volume contains a variety of contributions from a number of disciplines on this important theme of migration. And it's our hope that this volume will contribute to scholarly deliberations as well as to a more profound theological and ethical reflection on the topic of migration. Simultaneously, we remain conscious that the experience of migration and the themes that it raises are much more extensive than one volume can contain. And accordingly, we hope that this volume may be play a part in the larger conversation on matters surrounding migration and life in transit within faith communities, but also broader.